very much for the introduction and thank you for the idea to have this series. I hope it's not a problem that Wrexham is on part of the slides, but uh, if there's content there that you can't see, we'll try to just move stuff along. Um, so five minutes to tell you about some exciting things about the work I do. All right, I'm up for the challenge. So my name's Emily. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology. I am the co-director of the Social Brain in Action Lab. And before I tell you just a little taster of our research, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the fantastic doctoral students, postdocs, and master's students in the lab that do all of this work, and of course, the fabulous funding bodies who pay for it. All right, so the work that we do in the Social Brain and Action Lab uh, focuses on how we perceive other people and how we interact with other people in a social environment. So you can think of all sorts of everyday scenarios from the mundane to the complex, having a cup of coffee with a friend to climbing a mountain to dancing to everything in between where we're constantly observing and interacting with other people. This is something we do effortlessly, but a real big interest of my research is how we're able to coordinate and make sense of other people's actions in such an effortless manner. And you can think of all sorts of everyday examples like this where we're interacting with other people, but it's also becoming the case that more and more we're also going to start interacting with non-human agents, such as robotic agents and um, some sort of um, amalgams between humans and robots. So we're not only interested in the social brain and action lab, how we interact and perceive other humans' actions, but we're also inter interested in how we interact and perceive non-human agents and robots. So this work is predicated on a very uh, simple um, theoretical stance, which is that we make sense of other people's movements and what they're doing and what they want in the world by using our own experience as a template. So we use um, parts of the brain which are collectively known as the social brain network, which um, broadly include occipitotemporal regions, premotor regions, and parietal parts of the brain. And these parts of the brain store our past experiences with, with moving, with observing other people, and with what we know about other people to make sense of others. And um, this idea has really Perfect. Um, <laughs> has uh, really um, kind of been moved along in the past 10 years or so with what's been called the like me hypothesis. And what that box says is that the like me hypothesis uh, posits that the social brain is tuned to respond most to other agents who move like us and who look like us. So if, if someone's the same race, if someone um, does the same dance style, plays the same sport, um, or is a human and we're a human, our brain should respond more strongly because that's the kind of experience that we have in the past. So what I'm going to talk about are two little strands, um, just or two little snippets um, of how we approach these questions about uh, this like me hypothesis and whether the social brain network is really tuned to our past experience. So the first kind of thing, the first type of experience I'm going to talk about um, are how we use laboratory induced training paradigms to investigate this question of how experience shapes perception. So this is just a cartoon schematic of how we frequently um, approach these sorts of questions. So we, we do human neuroimaging, we work a lot with functional magnetic resonance imaging, and what we usually do is we, scans, we scan people's brains while they're watching a certain kind of video stimulus. Um, before anything happens. And then they come into the laboratory. So it can be as short as five days of consecutive experience or it can be as long as six weeks. We've not gone on to many years of experience yet, but we do induce um, certain types of experience in our participants. Then we scan their brains again. So what we're really talking about here is we're teaching people how to do certain actions or we're giving them a lot of visual experience watching certain types of actions that they might not be able to do with their own body. And then we're really interested in how this scanning session, what's going on in their brain differs from this scanning session. And we can quantify just what kind of experience they've had and how that's going to shape the brain. And we aren't just interested in brain responses, we're also interested in people's behavior. So we try to really um, closely link together how the brain changes with how our behavior changes. So that's why we have uh, behavioral retests afterwards. And we've done this, um, these sorts of training, these laboratory training paradigms with a number of different um, visual action learning and physical action learning paradigms, which have included, oh, I don't think we're going to have sound, but you'll hear it a little bit from my laptop. Um, uh, we use uh, dance video games such as this so people can learn very complex and exciting movements like um, hip-hop dance club moves. Um, we've also done these training paradigms with um, looking at uh, object-based actions. So this, we did a long series of studies with people learning how to tie knots, as you see here. And you're going to miss probably most of the most exciting one, which is we looked at visual experience on how people perceive gymnasts in action. And um, yeah, so we have a number of different approaches that we've used to, to look at how these different types of experience shape brain and behavior. And 
just to highlight one small result from this, um, we now have a few studies that have really tried to compare observational learning and physical learning. So if you're um, watching someone else tie knots versus tying knots yourself, or you're watching someone else learn to dance versus learning to dance yourself, we're interested in how both of these types of experience are shaping brain responses. And we have some really nice evidence that shows that parts of this social brain network that I showed you a few slides ago, um, particularly the premotor cortex, seems to represent visual experience and motor experience in the same way. And this, we think, is really pushing boundaries forward in terms of how we learn from others and how our own experience shapes perception. So that's kind of one facet of it. And the second facet I want to talk about, again, is this social nature of other agents. So we talked about um, this idea that we're not just seeing and interacting with human agents, but robots and robotic type movement is becoming more ubiquitous in our daily lives. So we did one study um, a few years ago where we had um, humans who moved like humans and animated Lego robots who moved like humans. And we compared that to what goes on when you see, and <laughs> you can't see our human guy here, believe me, he's awesome. He's moving just like this guy is here. And, um, and we, we had this question about, well, if we use our own experience to make sense of other people, well, we don't have experience looking like or moving like a robot. So how are we going to make sense of actions um, that we will have experience with in our daily lives, but we, ha we can't move that way and we don't look that way ourselves? And what we found from this study um, was quite surprising based on uh, it's a shame that's right there. Based on uh, what previous work showed, so the like me hypothesis says you really use these parts of your brain um, that are based on your own experience to make sense of uh, what you see other people doing. But we kind of found just the opposite. We found that you're using these parts of your brain, these parts of the social brain network, much more when you're seeing unfamiliar agents or unfamiliar actions. So this kind of flies in the face of we're hardwired to use our own experience to make sense of others. It says that actually the system is much more flexible and we're using um, these same sort of social brain areas to make sense of non-social agents and non-social actions. What's quite interesting is we also followed this up with um, this identical study. We ran it with um, four-month-old infants using a different kind of neuroimaging called um, functional near infrared spectroscopy. And we found a really nice replication of the adult data in the infant brain, in the very young child human brain. Um, so it suggests that this isn't something that's necessarily um, be really being shaped by experience throughout our development, but we seem to be born with this, flexible, this flexibility within um, these parts of our brain to make sense of other agents' actions. Um, just one little uh, teaser for some study, for some work that just came out. We are following this question up about making sense of human versus non-human um, agents' actions to ask, are there any parts of the brain that are really sensitive to human-only movements that aren't um, able to flexibly adapt to interacting with a robotic agent? And this work um, is giving us some evidence that there is one little part of the social brain network way back here in the temporal parietal junction that seems to be absolutely hardwired to respond to other human agents um, and human actions. So it's not, I mean, this is a network, this isn't just one brain region, it's a set of brain regions, and it seems like some parts really are flexibly adaptive to make sense of other people, even if we don't have, or other agents, even if we don't have that kind of experience, whereas other parts are very much saying, I care about humans, this is a human detecting region, and I want to know whether I'm interacting with a human or interacting with a non-human robotic agent. So to sum that all up, um, what we tried to show in the SOBA lab, uh, what we try to test, are the limits of how we make sense of other people's actions and how our own experience shapes um, our perception and our ability to interact with others. And we look at physical training, we look at visual training, we look at social experience with other agents and actions. And we use um, a combination of brain imaging methods to try to address these questions. And we've seen with studies looking at training and dance that certain parts of the brain, such as um, inferior parietal lobule and premotor cortex, they really respond to visual and motor experience in the same ways, whereas when we're looking at the robotic and human stuff, we see that, um, again, IPL and PMV, these parts of parietal and premotor social brain areas, um, are flexibly adaptive to respond to human or non-human agents, whereas temporal parietal junction is very much hardwired to make sense of other humans in our environment. So that's it. Thank you very much.